new venture started by a lone individual in the family kitchen. And we know California is a prime example. We are the epitome of the power of the innovation economy. San Francisco, LA, San Diego, they remain at the top of every list of startup economies across all measures, whether we're talking about the number of startups, the number of IPOs, equity plays, patents filed, all that. The state literally created the formula for the startup ecosystem. Partnerships between private enterprise and economic anchor institutions like universities, research labs, access to capital, access to technical assistance, physical spaces where innovators can gather and share ideas and work them out. We know that there's magic in all of that. It's been proven. But there is still something missing in that formula. And that's an emphasis on inclusion and equity. The formula rewards the first to market and the path to that milestone is often paved by privilege. The right education enforced by resume algorithms that scan for Stanford or MIT, social connections to deep pockets, being born in zip codes that raise your odds for having the first two things, the economic security to focus on creativity instead of necessity. So we must diversify this innovation economy to make it even more significant ingredient in California's secret sauce for success. That which makes us the fifth largest economy in the world. So here again, study after study, demonstrates a correlation between a diverse workforce on both racial and gender lines, as well as age and educational background with innovation revenue. So one more stat. A 2020 Citigroup uh, report estimated that including more women and black Americans in the initial stages of innovation could increase US GDP by as much as $640 billion. <laughs> the report further argues that the United States aggregate economic output would be $16 trillion higher today if identified racial gaps had been closed in the year 2000. So just 23 years ago, we could have a $16 trillion higher economic GDP output. So one example of how my office is supporting that objective is our Accelerate California program, where we are investing $16.5 million in 13 inclusive innovation hubs around the state. There's one in San Francisco, of course, Another one in LA, of course. Another one in San Diego, of course. But there's also one in Fresno, the Wet Center, and it's on the Fresno State campus. And there's one in Bakersfield, operated by a black-led organization. And Sacramento and Chico, and thank you for that, because prior to my being in this position, black organizations were not being funded. So the most exciting part of that program is when I said, can we create some capital here for our businesses that matriculate through these programs? Governor said yes. And so we have an acceleration grant program as a part of the Accelerate California inclusive innovation hub program so that businesses that come through these 13 programs will be eligible for grants up to $100,000 each to seed their dream. I'm gonna skip ahead, I see you, Cheryl. Are you okay. giving me the time?
Yes. 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 So I want to say, as a former leader of a black-led organization, that real partnership comes with real resources. I used to always balk when the funders would say, yep, we've got this for your program. You just can't pay your people out of it. We don't want to pay staff. We don't want to pay buildings. And I used to always ask, well, who's going to do the work? If we can't pay the people, who is going to do the work? So I posit that we need to turn the entire system upside down. We need to value the leaders meeting, and we need to value the output of the organizations, and that starts with partnership and real resources. My third and final <coughs> initiative is driving economic mobility through entrepreneurship. My office recently commissioned a study, and some great folks in this room were part of producing that. It was the first ever study of its kind by a state agency, and it's called the State of Diverse Businesses in California. <coughs> and it quantifies the social, fiscal, and economic impact of businesses owned in California by people of color. It's an 80-page report, so it's a little reading, and I could quote from it forever, but I'm only gonna give you a few, and I urge you to download it from our website, calosba.ca.gov, and quote it yourself. Let me emphasize the very first fact from the report that tends to surprise people. Not so surprising to me, but as I said earlier, there are 4.1 million small businesses in California. 1.9 million of them are owned by people of color. That's 46% of all the businesses that we know how to count right now, and there's even more we know in the informal economic activity that we can't yet capture using government measuring sticks. So 40% of the official jobs engine of the state is created, owned, and operated by people of color. But the overwhelming majority of those diverse businesses, including Hispanics, Asians, Black and African Americans, as well as Native Americans, they are run by sole proprietors with one or two employees. There are about 185,000 Black and African American small business owners in California and all but 10,000 of them are non-employer businesses. So all that economic activity is carried on the backs of single individuals who, for obvious reasons, are usually too busy working in the business to be working on the business to grow it. Here's another tidbit from our report. Those 10,000 black-owned employer businesses out of the 185,000 pay a higher than average per capita payroll compared to all employer businesses collectively. Yes, the average for all businesses is 51,000 a year. But when a black business scales, and hires employees, the average salary is $71,000 a year. <laughs> kind of interesting there, huh? Yeah, so what that says is, when we grow large enough to employ others, we beat the bar and we share the wealth. Economic developers often
often talk about business starts because we like to count how many businesses we help to launch. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I think that there is a bigger opportunity. In pursuit of economic equity, and that is in helping <clears throat> existing businesses scale. If just 10% of the existing businesses owned by people of color were to scale to five employees, this would add 660,000 jobs in California. If half of them got to five employees, so we're not talking mega businesses here, five employees, it would add 3.3 million jobs in our economy. Yes, 3.3 million jobs which represents about an 18% jump in the total jobs just by helping existing business owners of color do better. That number measures jobs and the economic contribution of 1.9 million revenue generating entities. And I like those numbers as a person who's responsible for small business. But I also know, as the granddaughter of a woman who ran her own beauty salon out of her home in Bakersfield, California, that this also measures the well-being of 1.9 million families in this state whose future depends on the viability of those businesses. It measures their ability to send their kids to college, to buy homes, to retire comfortably. It measures the respect paid to 1.9 million role models living in our communities. And like my grandmother, because she didn't just do hair, she provided an essential service to black women in yeah. Bakersfield. Yeah. She empowered and elevated black women by styling their hair and instilling confidence in their personhood as they went out in the world to take care of their families. And I have to say that as a young girl, generations of young people watching in real time the challenges and rewards that come with owning your own business. So I say her memory is never far from my thoughts and as I think and chart the most effective way forward for small businesses in this state, I often reflect on her desire. Before I close, I want to give you just one more example of a program that is really the flagship of my office. That's our support for a network of small business centers and lenders around the state who are committed to helping our small businesses thrive. I'm talking about our boots on the ground, hands on, side by side, rooting for you, everyday kind of help. The governor's provided me with $26 million in permanent annual funding to support a network of these small business centers across the state. When I assumed office, we had 83 of them. We are now found funding 107 of them this year. We serve dozens of industries and in dozens of languages. Supporting the partners that deliver these services, all federally funded partners you know, small business development centers, women's business centers, veterans, but also chambers of commerce and other nonprofits. This is the core function of my office. Thank you. And a big source of pride for me because we know what a difference they make for their clients. If you make an appointment with one of them, you can expect to meet someone who is totally invested in your success. Our centers cover the full spectrum of business needs from writing a business plan 
and obtaining the right permits and licenses to finding capital, to marketing e-commerce, all of it, even succession strategy. Some of my favorite programs are industry specific. We supported childcare after the pandemic so that we could help women get back to work. And I wanna say, we don't know what we don't know at the outset, right? No one has a magic wand for any business challenge, but business advisors can provide the experience and the objective perspective that you can't from the vantage seat of the owner, right? And what they will do is help you optimize your best assets, which are your good ideas, your energy, and your ability to continue to adapt and learn. Small business owners tend to think they have to know it all, they have to be it all, and they have to do it all, because after all, they're the boss, right? But you don't. You don't have to go it alone, and you shouldn't when these no-cost and low-cost services are available to you. I talked about my grandmother. She didn't have a board of directors or a suite of executives or expensive consultants. <coughs> Heck, she didn't even have an account. <laughs> what could she have achieved with somebody <coughs> like that in her corner? So this is why the state will continue to fund and support the existing network of small business centers. And I just want to say that Having described all of that effort and investment to you, I still ask myself, would Dr. King, the economic justice warrior, be disappointed if he could see America in 2024? I posit he'd be disappointed that black and Hispanic households still own about 24 cents for every $1 of white family wealth on average? Would he be saddened by the full-scale backlash on diversity, equity, and inclusion in corporate America and academia just a mere four years after the murder of George Floyd? I think we can be fairly sure of that. But he might also be disappointed in me if I were to leave the stage on a defeatist thought. So I won't. Because diverse owned businesses contribute $192.8 billion to the California economy. We know that the contribution of people of color to the success of the state's economy and that of the nation as the fifth largest economy in the world. So Dr. King, I posit, would remind all of us to use the power we have to continue to create change in people and institutions. So I leave you with what he called life's most persistent and urgent question in the context of our topic today. And that is, what are you doing for others? What are you doing for others? Thank you all for your time and attention today. Thank you for the invitation. It has been my pleasure to see this come to fruition. God bless you. I'm president and CEO of FCI Management, and I am the vice chair of California African American Chamber of Commerce. So we've heard, 
today from our state leaders, and they really uh, got this crowd pretty enthusiastic. And now we're going to take a look at our local cities. So today we have a fabulous panel of local mayors across the state that are going to bring their perspective of challenges and opportunities. So I'd like to introduce my very good friend who will be moderating this panel and fellow board member, Mayor Deborah Robinson. But well, Mayor Robinson's visionary and distinctive leadership style has thrust the city of Rialto into the national spotlight as a recognized leader in the areas of public and private partnerships, businesses, development, and job creation. Mayor Robinson was elected mayor in November of 2012, the latest achievement in a distinguished public service career that has included 12 years on the Rialto City Council, leadership position at the Southern California Association of Governments, the San Bernardino Association of Governments, and more than 20 years with the California Department of Transportation. She has previously served as the Environment and Energy Chair at the Community, Human, and Public Health Subcommittee Chair for Southern California Association of Governments. She is a member of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, Water Council, and Metro Economies, and a member of Mayors Against Illegal Guns. Yay! That's amazing. So please help me welcome my fellow board member, Mayor Deborah Robertson. Still morning, and um, I'm going to immediately call up the uh, mayors who are going to be a part of my panel. And I also want to have you guys take a minute and stand up and have a, a break. Just stand up. I mean, if most of us, we've been sitting. I appreciate that we are doing that. And while I call my mayors up, I would appreciate if you give them a round of applause. First off, I want to introduce Mayor Aquanetta Warren for the great city of Fontana, California. And I'm going to successfully managed to go and win her fourth term as mayor in the great city of Fontana. So give it up for her. She's on the New York Conference of uh, uh, Mayor. And then I want to also take the opportunity to welcome up one of my colleagues who sits with me on the Southern California Association of Government, and he's the mayor of Santa Monica, California. He's also on my policy committee with Energy and Environment. Give it up to Mr. Bill Brock coming up. And wow, I know that, where is the chair? He always gets those, you'll be right when I create. Uh, an executive decision. So where is Mr. <laughs> Mr. Simon? I want to let you know that I am going to join my colleagues and I have a wonderful guest moderator who has done a lot of things to help with moving local state legislation, but he keeps his ears and foot and everything to the grind. And I've asked former Senator Rod Wright to moderate this local I'm about succession planning, and I'm known as the kids' mayor in Rialto. And I'm going to give you guys something that you haven't seen while we all get up here. I am going to introduce one of my little entrepreneurs who is uh, happens to be also an opera singer. She has her own business in Rialto. She's a great, uh, no, age of, I believe, 10. And I want you to welcome Anessa Mouton, who is also an opera singer, and she is going to give us a brief mm -hmm. intro on um, a song which is she sings in Italian called O Mio Bambino Caro. So give it up for Anessa Mouton. <laughs>
She performed this past summer at the Dorothy Chandler during the summer program.